Welcome to the chaos sector. Before we get started, there's something I want to point out. Some have voiced their opinion about the private driver and how he wouldn't necessarily honk his horn goodbye. Someone said it's quote, super minor, that he didn't interact with the girls upon dropping them off. Well, here's the thing, he knows those girls, even other housemates. He's so familiar with them, that he knew where they worked. According to a Law and Crime article, who interviewed him, he said that he had driven Mogan, Gonzalez, and Kernodal, many times. Quote, they were all nice girls. They were always polite with me. They were happy friendly girls. In my opinion, there was nothing bad about them, unquote. He went on to say, quote, they were all good employees at Mad Greek, unquote. Now because of this relationship between the private driver and those housemates, it is likely that every time he drove them home, he would be just as polite and courteous to give them a little honk on his way. It's not like he's a stranger, he could be considered a quote, driver friend. They may have even depended on him when they needed a designated driver. If they were so polite and happy and friendly, they would always say bye to him and he would return with a honk. Hmm, interesting he never mentioned Bethany or Dylan, don't you think? In any manner. The three girls who were murdered, he mentions, and knows where they worked. Although he allegedly showed the authorities receipts for his whereabouts, it doesn't exclude him from being a part of a strategic plan. If the Moscow PD originally claimed Madison and Kaylee arrived at home around 1.45 a.m., once again, where would they get the specific time from, other than the private driver who took them home? This is not a boneheaded mistake by the authorities, even in covering up a murder, they wouldn't blatantly give the wrong details, as if they knew specifically when those girls arrived, you understand? So where did that time come from? It had to come from the private driver. And if we estimate the travel time from the garden lounge, which is where the grub truck was stationed, it takes about five minutes to get to King Road. He claimed to pick them up around 1.40 to 1.45, so it would be approximately 1.50 a.m. The funny thing with that estimated time, it's in between both the 1.45 a.m. time of arrival and the 1.56 a.m. time of arrival. Because of the 1.40 a.m. time mentioned, you see? So Moscow PD would go based on the exact time he gave them, which would be 1.40 a.m. And then he told them 1.45 a.m. and dropping them off. We don't want to waste too much time here, but this needs to be pointed out. There is no other explanation for the initial 1.45 a.m. time, which is what he told Moscow PD. But the sister claimed that time was wrong. Now stop. At this very moment in the investigation. The sister corrected the time of the private driver. Yes, because that time is what he gave Moscow PD. Now who would know for sure what time the girls arrived back home, the person bringing them back home, or a sister who claims she spotted that very person bringing them back home in surveillance? I'm assuming you would believe it would be the private driver. But then this is where things get suspicious, because he changes the time to 1.56 a.m. Either the private driver lied to Moscow PD, which makes him a suspect, or the sister lied about when the girls got home, because there is no way she could know for sure based on where the camera was located. Too many vehicles would drive on that road, unless she identified the vehicle. But that vehicle has not been identified. It would be different, if the sister would know based on Kaylee calling her, telling her she got back home. She never mentioned a phone call, which would be more likely of a source of confirmation than surveillance footage facing the opposite direction of your sister's home, right? In my opinion, they're both lying. But that's for another time. All right, we'll leave that for you to ponder. That leaked footage, especially from Linda Lane, may have proven the murders happened earlier. Many would assume this, but I think we have audio evidence to confirm this. You may say, well yeah, we heard a lot of noise in the earlier hours. Sure, but we like to reveal the deception first, then we travel down the path to truth. In the Linda Lane footage alleged to be when Koberger returned to the home, I notice it's very quiet. The only noise you hear, are vehicles for the most part. No screaming, no barking, not even anyone speaking in the background. Also, with all of those vehicles driving around, surely they spotted Koberger hanging around, right? Nobody has come out and stated they saw a white Hyundai Elantra snooping around in the neighborhood. But throughout that surveillance, especially during the 4 a.m. hour, there are vehicles heard driving all over the place. There are only two directions you can go my friends, either down Taylor to Valenta, or Taylor to King Road. 
so someone would have spotted the vehicle, merely based on traffic observation. You understand? If you guys have the patience, because we surely do, examine from 4.05 a.m. to the end of that surveillance, which ends around 5 a.m. There is no screaming, no barking, no whimpering, nothing. Let's play a game, called, Find the Missing Pieces. Dylan's accounts in her affidavit states she awakened around 4 a.m. to what she assumed was Kaylee upstairs playing with Murphy. So she would hear the dog barking, right? Well, from 3.59 a.m. to 4.05 a.m. to 5 a.m., there is no dog barking, furthermore, there is not much of anything as far as audio during this time frame. Mind you, we've heard a dog barking countless times in this surveillance, earlier. The alleged Koberger is spotted around 4.05 a.m., but it's not likely that was him. Here are a few reasons why. Because there were screams, the dog was barking. None of this was heard during the time frame the alleged Koberger had returned to attack around 4.05 a.m., nor throughout that surveillance. Yet in the previous hours, there is literally all types of hysteria going on. From the time of 1.45 a.m. to 4 a.m., there is screaming, barking, even the dog is heard howling at one point, individuals heard making intriguing statements, and the infamous audio alleged to be linked to the murders. None of this was heard during the 4 a.m. hour, it was completely silent as far as activity. Only vehicles are heard driving around. If this surveillance had been released to the media, everyone could come to the logical conclusion that the murders happened in the 1.45 a.m. to 3 a.m. time frame. It has enough audio evidence to suggest someone was being attacked. Now for the audio that has so-called been debunked. We will examine it, trust me. In addition, when a dog howls, it could be for several reasons. Either the dog is lonely, as its owners leave the home, it could be hungry, or it could detect strange noise or activity, such as domestic violence. In this case, it would be a massacre. The direction in which that dog is heard barking from is in fact to the western region of the surveillance either in the Queen Road apartments or of course, Murphy in the victim's home. Mind you, this is all occurring before 4 a.m. I have to keep pointing this out, there is no barking, no screaming, literally no indication of physical engagement during that 4 a.m. time frame. Yet, we all know there was screaming, the pain of being stabbed would cause one to scream out in excruciating pain. Many would suggest, they were being stabbed in such a rapid pace, they couldn't really scream out in pain. Even if this were the case, at least two out of the four victims would be heard screaming out in pain. You can't avoid the screaming aspect. Furthermore, the girls in particular, would scream out before they are even stabbed, as the killers enter their rooms. A knife is being wielded, or some other sharp weapon, and they weren't asleep. So once the killers come into their room, the girls immediately start screaming. That's also a key element. And this brings us back to the different account of Dylan. She states she heard screaming, but thought it was the girls upstairs partying. Of course this is not what she thought, as the more screaming was heard, the more she would realize there was violence in the home. Inan Harsh, the loner neighbor, stated he heard a scream. Seemed to be the only neighbor who came out and stated he heard something. Everyone else has zipped their lips. Oh wait, the female referred to as Dot, publicly spoke out and stated she also heard a scream. Their accounts of what they heard and observed have been essentially discredited. But how long will people work to discredit what people claim to have heard or witnessed, before realizing those individuals stay in that neighborhood, so they know something? If it's just based on that fact alone, we know they heard something, if not everything. Perhaps some things are embellished or stated in a way to avoid certain things, but it is a fact that they live in the same neighborhood and are in the same area of the victim's home. Let's not discredit them, rather, keep their accounts of that night in our investigative notes. That's how a true crime investigator handles such information. The murders happened during a circus of activity makes it easier to disguise the violence. The killers were cunning, they committed the murders while there was a lot of activity going on. Quickly get in and get out while the party town is still active. This way, all the screaming, dog barking, and other noise blends in with all the other activity. It doesn't matter if the screaming sounds a bit more serious, as many would chalk it up to, drunk people having a physical altercation. Of course from our view on the outside looking in, we view the screaming literally as someone being murdered. But some of those neighbors wouldn't be alarmed of violence of that magnitude. Notice I said, some, neighbors. The next-door neighbors, well, they knew. 
and that surveillance from that home is being protected. Sure, they leaked out some random screenshot, but that was to entice many to investigate it. Well, here you go. Moscow PD had visited that home and reported that the home's security camera picked up whimpers, a dog barking, and a loud thud coming from the victim's home. No mention of screaming, though. Now if we go back to the Linda Lane surveillance, there is all types of noise, screaming, barking, people yelling, I even detected a bit of mumbling from someone who stayed in those apartments. All of this, wasn't picked up by that security camera? Of course it was. Based on all of that activity, Moscow PD came to the conclusion that the murders occurred around 3 a.m. How did they come to this conclusion? Did they base this on what the medical examiner stated? Negative. Where did they come to this conclusion from? That Linda Lane, nope, not that one. The next-door neighbor's security camera, as it picked up all of the violence in that home. Mind you, the 3 a.m. time of death is when everything had come to an end. It was entirely too quiet during the 4 a.m. time frame. Perhaps the word had quickly got out, and everyone went inside, locked their doors, and swore to say nothing, even when questioned by the authorities. And the white vehicle? If we come to the logical conclusion that the murders occurred earlier, I have this growing belief that the vehicle was an unmarked cruiser. The authorities were called by someone, perhaps an officer who quote, oversaw what would happen. And two minutes after that white vehicle departed, a darker vehicle arrives and heads down the alley of Queen Road Apartments. Could this have been unmarked officers, cleaning up the crime scene, before the later morning hours? It would explain why there wasn't any real, I repeat, real DNA of any suspects in the home, except for the planted knife, let me rephrase that, except for the knife sheath. It would also explain why the additional DNA of three males were never identified. They know exactly who those three males are. And also, the initial report claims the murders occurred within the 3 a.m. hour. Just like the private driver accounts, there is obviously a misdirection of time. You wouldn't be able to tell that it's an officer, but I tell you, there is a segment in that Linda Lane surveillance where I heard a male voice that sounded very, quote, authoritative. It's a college neighborhood, and that voice sounded like a male in his late 30s. I have to go back and find the timestamp. I am convinced, plainclothes officers were lurking around before, during, and after those murders. Because those murders were not based on a stalker, it was an organized hit. And definitely someone with a badge had the heads up on it. In my opinion, of course. This vehicle, which appears to be black or dark blue, had circled Queen Road Apartments from 3.30 a.m. to 4.07 a.m. First it was spotted at 3.30 a.m. Then nine minutes later, it circles again at 3.39 a.m. Then again, it circles at 3.57 a.m. And then finally, based on the surveillance, it circles at 4.07 a.m. This vehicle is obviously suspicious, and I would even suggest was scoping the scene. We have to assume that vehicle is linked to the murders, because if it were someone who was visiting residents in Queen Road Apartments, surely they would stay on the phone to let them know exactly where their apartment is located, right? They wouldn't be confused about an address, because the resident would let them know exactly where the address was. So based on logic, the vehicle is not visiting anyone in Queen Road Apartments, and without this being the reason they continued to circle around those apartments, we have to assume it was watching the victim's home each time it circled back around. If this was drug-related, then obviously there are officers on the payroll. It's a problem throughout many police departments. The problem here is that is physical surveillance, while the surveillance from the neighbor's home is merely a screenshot. If you release footage that shows the alleged Coburger at 4.05 a.m. in the Linda Lane surveillance, well, he would have to be spotted coming from a previous location, right? Where is the surveillance from the neighbor's home that shows the alleged Coburger arriving and departing? It exists, right? The neighbor's camera is positioned to see any and everyone entering the neighborhood. There is only one entrance, so they will spot all activity. If you recall, in our previous episodes, we mentioned how that home may have been security detail for the drug trafficking ring. Funny how those college students have a security camera, but the victim's home didn't have one when it was slated the party house? We still believe there is a camera in that home somewhere, which we will break down in the future. I believe these leaks of surveillance are the workings of someone associated with Moscow PD, or should I say, the crooked officers in the department. 
They believe that the surveillance of that white vehicle spotted will sway the public into thinking it was Koberger. But that's not even our focus, it's all of the activity before the white vehicle arrives. Also, three males were apparently near the home that night. That DNA has not revealed an identity of those three males. Now in what murder investigation would have more DNA found and yet it is not deemed a possible suspect and the identity revealed? The defense is starting to put pressure on the prosecution. We tried to tell everyone in the previous series that the prosecution was going to have a hard time. Now they are literally skipping around, even claiming those DNA samples haven't been successfully scanned. Even suggesting that it wasn't an issue? Are you kidding me? Try to convince Koberger of this, who's facing the death penalty. This is outrageous. Many assume that it's a party house, and there would be tons of DNA found in the home. Well, why were only three obtained then? Let me rephrase that, why were those samples even collected if there would be so many traces of DNA in the home? And the only DNA successfully processed was Koberger's? The prosecution can't explain away this problem, and it comes all the way back to our previous conclusion regarding DNA. Mind you, the defense requested the procedure of how his DNA was collected. But this translates to, Koberger's DNA was planted in the home, without saying it. Koberger even stated early on, that it wasn't his DNA found on the knife sheath. Could it be the very three males who were seen running away from King Road? This would be approximately 3 a.m. Quote, court documents, filed by attorneys for the 28-year-old PhD student last week, argue that DNA from two other men was also found inside the off-campus home in Moscow, Idaho. DNA from a third unknown man was also found on a glove found outside the property on November 20, one week from the murders, the documents state. By December 17, lab analysts were aware of two additional males' DNA within the house, where the deceased were located, and another male DNA on a glove found outside the residence on November 20, unquote. Now, from November 20 to December 17 of last year, there hasn't been any report of these males identified. If Moscow PD cleared those who were identified, such as the housemates, the private driver, the ex-boyfriend, and other peers who were interviewed, wouldn't they feel the need to identify those unknown males whose DNA was either in the home or found on a glove outside the home? The defense is requesting information on how Koberger's DNA was collected, but they also want to know, were there any tests done on the other DNA found at the crime scene? It appears, the prosecution has something to hide, because have not provided the procedure of obtaining Koberger's DNA, nor has there been any identification of those males who were also in that home. And this is why it's important, because through that forensics process, they can determine the life of the DNA, or how long it had been in the home. Days, weeks, months, years, or even, from that night. It's likely that those samples of DNA, are clear. Meaning, there isn't any forensic complexities to identifying who those individuals were, contrary to the so-called procedure used to identify Koberger. Sample the DNA, by way of fingerprints, bodily fluids such as saliva, sweat, hair samples, or even blood, and you get a more direct source to identification. The reason they decided to run from that? Moscow PD would have to reinvestigate the crime scene, bringing all of the previous individuals who had been cleared, back to the interrogation table. And what if those DNA samples would place those males at the home the time of the murders? We would have conflicting evidence. Who's more likely to be there, those three males, or Koberger with DNA found on a knife sheath, that position had been reported as being in two different locations on Madison's bed. The prosecution is in a pickle of a situation, but more so, they are essentially taking the blame for what detectives failed to do, on purpose. Quote, we didn't know it would be an issue, unquote. Bill Thompson, is in court, showing signs of suspicion. How could you possibly think that the defense request for information on the other male DNA found in the home would be basically irrelevant? Translation, we thought our frame would work, we have his DNA on a knife sheath on the victim's bed, he was spotted in surveillance, the mainstream media has claimed he stalked one of the victims, oh yeah, he's guilty. Are you that arrogant, to assume the defense will just accept this? Or better yet, Koberger would accept being framed, as the evidence against him is so overwhelming? Someone's life is on the line, they will not go down without a fight. And for the prosecution to tiptoe around that request on how they obtained Koberger's DNA, and also the request to present the other male's DNA and their identities, it appears those males are physically inside the home the night of the murders. In my opinion. 
Remember WSU Kim and her claims about what her daughter told her? The daughter told her, of course through word of mouth, but her daughter told her that there were people there to buy drugs, and a creeper was also there. Mind you, the term creeper could apply to anyone that the college students didn't know. Or it could be a nickname for an actual college student at the University of Idaho. There isn't a time given, but from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m., there was a lot of activity that night. And if we factor in those males spotted running from the direction of King Road, it's possible they were at the home. Now this does create an environment of drug trafficking, which is a bit of a touchy situation regarding the housemates. We don't want to slate them as criminals, but we also have to accept a possible reality that they were, or at least some of them. We can't physically see the home, but we definitely heard a lot of activity from Linda Lane during that 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. time frame. And there is supporting evidence of drug trafficking, which comes from another camera on Linda Lane. Sure everyone has viewed that footage, but there was a male in a white hoodie, snooping around the dumpster, with a flashlight. A vehicle was previously spotted, heads down Linda Lane, stops, turns around and heads back out. But if you notice, the vehicle's passenger window was down, as we could see the dashboard inside the vehicle. It's possible that the quote, carrier, dropped the drugs off into the dumpster, perhaps a former football player with good aim. Moments later, the male in the white hoodie comes to that very dumpster, snoops around, and walks up the hill to the apartments. This was either a drug cell or the trafficking of drugs. So, everything points to a drug related crime all of a sudden. Reddit post, TikTok theories, all mentioning drug-related theories, have been essentially ridiculed and deemed detrimental to the investigation and also a slander of the victims. But there is enough evidence to come to the logical conclusion that those housemates were murdered, centered around drugs. Two of the victims' parents were drug addicts, but we won't get into that rabbit hole. But we must acknowledge that drugs are related either directly or indirectly to those housemates. A lot to break down, We'll leave it here for now. This is the Chaos Sector.